Okay, we're getting started with the DMRG algorithm. So let's see how much this takes. Um, for the session now, I have roughly about an hour, so a bit under an hour. Um, so we'll see this just, I think, two steps or three steps, 0, 1a, 1b, and 2. Um, but I'm guessing that's not going to be super straightforward. But uh, I, I hope I'm going to have to kind of learn a lot. I guess that's uh, just an interesting thing, at least to kind of scratch the tensor network uh, topic. Um, and uh, yeah, once I get something done, even if it's not perfect, then I'll probably just move on to the variational stuff. But let's see. Um, Good. So the density matrix renormalization renormalization group, DMRG, is an adaptive algorithm. So there's going to be some variational stuff going on for optimizing a matrix product state, MPS, or tensor train tensor network, such that after optimization, the MPS is approximately the dominant eigenvector of a large matrix H. So I guess what you want to, I guess what the dominant eigenvector means is um, the one that corresponds to the lower to the ground state. Is it? Mathematics. Hmm. With the highest modulus, mind you, yes, and this matters to the power iteration, blah, blah, blah. I want an easy answer. Power iteration. Dominant eigenvalues. The largest eigenvalue. Maybe that's the largest one, but that would be weird. The icon of matrix. I don't know, but some eigenvalue. Okay, so chances are this is what we want. Um, the matrix H is usually assumed to be a Hermitian matrix, but the algorithm can also be formulated for more general matrices. Uh, okay, so I'm not so sure. What was the Hermitian matrix, by the way? I I'm not so sure if this is going to work then. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong button. So, is the cubo then going to have Hermitian? Like, are we fulfilling the prerequisites of this at all? Hermitian cubo. Because mm. I don't think that the cube is Hermitian, so... We can test that. So Hermitian, uh, a Hermitian matrix, or self a joint matrix, is a complex square matrix that is equal to its own conjugate transpose. That is the element of the i-th row and the j-th column is equal to the complex conjugate of the element of the j-th row and the i-th column. The conjugate transpose. Okay. How do how to do that? I could check these, right? Simpy conjugate transpose. Is it just a dagger? Because you can transpose that. Dagger. In a part of part conjugate I mean, conjugate of an argument from X which is equivalent to transpose and complex conjugate. So that's dagger. General I mean, conjugate operation. Maybe that's this. I sorry so because that'll be something that we need to probably check, but because I'm not so sure if this is um Okay, but that's something to check. So maybe what we should do is open this up and just write it down in terms of the steps. Can I just run everything? Does this run the whole, like? Okay, so that restarts the kernel and run all cells. Um, 
cool. And at the end, what you want to have is so what I want to do is I want to do now. The, so basically, I, what I need is I need to check. Oh, check if uh, Cubo is um, Hermitian. Cool. That's first kind of step. Um, the second step, oh, what else? Okay, so uh, we want the domain eigenvector. Um, the DMRG algorithm works by optimizing two neighboring MPS tensors at a time, combining them into a single tensor to be optimized. The optimization is performed using an iterative eigensolver approach, such as Lang, Langsos, or Davidson. Before the next step, the single tensor is fine. Okay, so the first is like you take two of those of the MPS elements and you try to find you try to find that eigen solver thing, uh, that that eigen uh, eigen uh, vector, I guess, using an iterative eigen solver approach such as Langsos or Davidson. Before the next step, the single tensor is factorized using an SVD or density matrix decomposition in order to restore the M the MPS form. Turns or what is it? Before the next step, the single tensor. It's factorized. So you take two neighboring MPS tensors at a time. You combine them into a single tensor. Then you you find these thing, and then you decompose them again. Okay. During this factorization, the bond dimension or tensor train rank can be adapted. This adaptation is optimal in the sense of preserving the distance between the tensor network after the optimization step and the network with the restored MPS from I don't know. Okay, so in physics, th this algorithm is mainly used to find ground states of Hamiltonians of many body quantum state quantum systems. It has also been extended to compute excited states and to simulate dynamical finite temperatures and non-equilibrium systems. Algorithms uh, have been developed for more general MPS computations, just summing two MPS, multiplying MPS or MPO networks. Okay, or finding MPS solutions to linear systems. Maybe that's what we wanna. No, that's not what we wanna do. Statement of the problems. Consider a Hermitian matrix H acting in a vector space that is the tensor product of n smaller spaces, each of dimension d. The DMRG algorithm. Okay, so that's your big thing. That's your, your big beast. But in our case, our big beast is just two-dimensional. The DMRG algorithm seeks the dominant eigenvector of H in the form of an MPS tensor network. So maybe we don't start with a, so maybe we don't start with a beast actually. Mm. Uh -huh. I see. Okay, I see what they're doing here. So that's kind of nice. Uh, let's see if I can pluck the pen. Let's see if I can pluck the pen here somehow. Maybe I cannot. Probably. Awesome, whatever. Um, because at the end of the day, that's kind of this gra this graphical representation here is kind of really what the definition of an eigenvalue uh, in the Wikipedia is, right? So it's kind of like the um, this thing here, yeah. So basically, like the lambda would be the eigenvalue. Yeah. Is it something like that? Exactly. So a times the eigenvector equals uh, lambda times v. Yeah. That's the that's kind of the same, right? So because you have this big gray box, that's the matrix. The MPS is the array, isn't it? I don't know. Mm. I kind of guess so because in our case it's a we've got a two-dimensional tensor and then uh, the array is just like one ball here I guess, which is an array. Yeah. So e zero is the minimum eigenvalue. Okay. For the algorithm to be efficient, H must have certain simplifying properties. For example, H could be the sum of local. H could be the sum of local terms. Or more generally, H could be given as an MPO tensor network. 
Mm -hmm. For the algorithm to be efficient, what is an NPO tensor network? The NPO form is the most natural one for the DMG, a DMRG algorithm and can efficiently represent many cases one would still consider such as when H is a sum of local terms. However, however, other simplifying forms of H can also permit efficient formulations of the DMRG algorithm. Okay, so what are the steps? Uh, okay, so you must be able to express H in an, in an NPO form. Matrix product operator. A matrix product operator is a tensor network where each tensor has two external uncontracted indices as well as two internal indices contracted with neighboring tensors in a chain-like fashion. Intuitively, if one thinks of matrix product state as parametrizing a large vector in high dimensional space, then an, an MPO is generally the case of matrix acting in the same space. Hmm. But but if our matrix is two dimensional, I don't know how we're going to be able to do that. To be honest. So what are the steps? The setup before beginning the DMRG algorithm, it is imperative to bring the initial MPS into an orthogonal form via a gauge transformation. Here we will choose to begin the DMRG algorithm assuming, without loss of generality, that the MPS tensors that the MPS tensors 2, 3, and are all right orthogonal. What is right right orthogonal tensor? <clears throat> and then an orthogonal matrix is a real square matrix whose so columns and rows are now consider uh, our uh, <laughs> sorry that was kind of orthogonal unit vectors orthonormal vectors okay mm -hmm. Before beginning the MRG algorithm, it is imperative to bring the initial MPS into an orthogonal form via a gauge transformation. The compression, a gauge chemical forms. The compression, because the compression or rounding algorithm above leads to an interesting observation. The MPS and after compression can be made if we try close to the original one, but it, it but it's made of isometric tensors, technically partially isometric. So I have no idea what is all this, because these tensors, with the result of diagonalizing Hermitian matrices, they have the property that uh, the product is the identity, or diagram diagrammatically, running the orientation these tensors take when viewed as part of the MPS, and they have the property that okay. Because of the right orthogonality property, we can interpret uh, the MPS tensors number uh, three, four, and five collectively as a change of basis from the basis of visible indices to the bond index alpha two as follows. This interpretation motivates transforming the matrix H into the I one, I sub one, I sub two, alpha two basis as given by the following diagram. <clears throat> I still don't know what this is doing. If we take H to be an NPO form, we can compute the transformation efficiently in defining the RJ tensors along the way. Of 
For efficiency, this crucial of the edge tensors be created by contracting each MPS or MPO tensor at a one at a time in a certain order as follows. What? To optimize the first bond tensor, B12. What is the bond? What is what is what is the what is this even a bond tensor? Ah, uh, those are just the indices. That's the way it's called. Okay, let's try to focus on the first step on the setup, because then it says optimization. So this is the step one will be probably where the variational part comes in. The adaptive restoration is having an improved and there's uh, MPS on the kind of percent uh, to bar. Um, otherwise, the algorithm will become inefficient. Okay, so now you kind of have this in your. Okay, so you have to do the SVD to basically get that into an MPS form again, because then that's just like uh, has more dimensions uh, or free uh, dimensions, and that will be then inefficient to multiply stuff, I guess. <clears throat> And then the second bond, crazy. Following the transition second bond, two MPS tensors corresponding to uh, very similar steps can be created to optimize the remaining MPS tensors two at a time and to adapt all of the bond indices to the MPS once. So that's kind of like rinse and repeat. Okay, and that's diagrammatic summary of main steps. Okay, so here you have these. Okay, that's it, right? So you do that. <laughs> B23 is optimized via an iterative method with the key step being the multiplication of H in projected form times B23. I have no idea what is this. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so what are we doing here? Actually, that's interesting because I absolutely have no idea how to even get started. But let's try to see if we can get started with step zero, at least. Before beginning the DMRG algorithm, it is imperative to bring the initial MPS into an orthogonal form via Gauss transformation. Um, here we will choose to begin with the DMRG algorithm, assuming without that the MPS tensor are all right orthogonal. Um, let's first start understanding. So, I mean, the why it's then because of the right orthogonality property, we can interpret the MPS tensors numbers, tens tensor numbers three, four, and five collectively as a change of basis. So what is a right orthogonal? Okay, so right orthogonal, if I understood this well, let's just clean up here. <clears throat> right orthogonal tensor. So that's what we're looking for. Tensor. Uh, mm -mm -mm. Rotations and proper orthogonal tensors. Because in the tensor network, tensor network, Google, GitHub, there were. <clears throat> so if you take a look at the documentation, there's a tutorial here. And the documentation basically it was uh, the tent of the composition. Basic instruction matrix product states. Maybe I should just do this. Maybe I should really just do this. Actually, I didn't realize there's yeah, interesting. Okay. Maybe let's okay, let's start let's one step uh, backwards. So Introducing matrix product states. One way to work around this dimension, like it is. Okay, so it seems like 
Okay, the cost of high-dimensional tensors. Oh, oh, so that's the beginning. Sorry, that's the beginning. Let's do this. Okay, so one step backwards. Let's really try to understand why is this even something that um, that is nice or that makes sense at all. So, in this tutorial, we'll give a basic, introdu basic introduction to matrix product states and show how to efficiently compute tensor components of an NPS and overlaps between two NPS. Cool. Um, so maybe actually what I should do, uh, not these, but like I'll probably close these and actually start a new notebook. Um, and I'll call it like just just MPS Playground or something like this. Playground. Cool. And so we'll just, you know, we'll just put this here and this here. And uh, so this is based on these, okay? So what we do is, I mean, what are we, what are we importing here? We are importing tensor network, NumPy, and and uh, Matplotlib. Um, cool. The cost of high-dimensional tensors. We begin by analyzing the scaling of the memory cost of storing and accessing elements of tensors with increasing rank and dimension. Um, while the computational complexity of accessing an item in a multidimensional array is uh, a one, the main cost of exponentially growing memory required to, to, uh, to the main cost is the exponentially growing memory required to store the tensor. Let our tensor be T S one to S N, where each S R sub I and then T is called the physical dimension of uh, and, and N is rank of the tensor. <clears throat> In uh, condensed matter or quantum computing applications, and it's usually the system size uh, or number of qubits. I like that actually it makes make reference to quantum computing. The standard graphical representation looks like that. So that's the number of qubits that you'd have. Where each line represents... Uh, hmm. But then, really? Now we're getting a bit confused with the Hamiltonian and the cube being like two dimensional then. Um. But I guess this is the Hamiltonian is always a matrix, right? Uh, yeah. Where each line represents an index of the tensor. Now let's create a tensor with random entries with ranks and physical dimensions that run over small ranges and analyze their memory requirements. Mm. Okay, I mean, that's kind of copy-paste anyway, but like, does this give me the same? So this produces the following output, um, and here you have the memory cost. Uh, yeah, okay, pretty nice. So, with N2, and 3 and 4 and 5 memory cost, yeah. Scales as d to the power of n. It's an exponential growth which quickly saturates our computational resources. Introducing matrix product states. In a way, the way to work around this dimensionality catastrophe is to focus on a particular kind of tensors, those that can be written as matrix product states. The word state here is related to the quantum state formed from the coefficients of the tensor. Mm -hmm. Matrix product states are special class of tensors that can be written as products over many rank three tensors. Here's the diagram of such MPS. Each square here represents a rank three tensor, rank two for the left and the right boundaries. Okay. As before, the vertical lines represent the physical indices. The new horizontal lines are called ancillary indices with the, f with the physical and ancillary indices at each side j labeled S, S sub j and alpha sub j respectively. 
and the connecting line between the two tenses squares represents the contraction over the common index of the two tenses. A varying width of the ancillary legs represents the fact that each dimension can be different. Their labels are in gray. With this convention, the MPS diagram above is a rigorous representation of the mathematical expression. Okay. So... And this tutorial will take all d sub i equal to the single to a single d. Any tensor can be written as an MPS by means of the singular value of the composition. Okay, so that was kind of that was what I was playing with before reading that, right? To kind of use the SVD to split the whole thing. Um, although at the cost of very high bond dimensions, exponentially high, as n approaches infinite. So we begin by creating directly the node structure of the MPS. First, we define functions to build each block of the MPS and then the MPS itself. So uh, the block function can construct a new matrix for the MPS with random numbers from 0 to 1. New matrix. <clears throat> Okay, create MPS. So, so this block creates the uh, the matrices, and then the MPS is basically an array of nodes. Connect edges to build MPS. Okay, let's try to unpack these. Okay, let's see. Let's see what this does. So. So the, this function basically creates a random matrix of a given dimension, number of dimensions. The create MPS does, um, it just given a rank and a dimension and bond dimension. Build the MPS tensor, it takes a node, so it creates a random node as an array, it concatenates then, uh -huh, okay, the rank will be here, the the number of like these S things here, right, so, so it creates as many nodes as like rank minus two, because this is the the boundary, first boundary in this, and the last boundary, and then the last boundary, okay, so that creates an, an MPS, and then connect Oh, and, then, and then it connects the edges. So connected edges. So connected is the MPS. Zero, 01 connecting to MPS. 1, 0. Okay, so the first index is the index of, I'd say, the node. And then the, the, the other index that's being used here is the actual dimension or the actual edge that you're trying to connect. So you're connecting the one with the zero. That's for the first boundary and the first one. And then you iterate over the ranks, over the rank and connect the two, because this is gonna have like uh, one, two, and three. So zero, one, two. So this is the one you're connecting with the zero, like the other one, yeah. And then you're appending that as a connected edge. And so what you return is the MPS and the connected edges. Okay. But that's funny because uh, actually, I thought that they actually had function to do that. Or I thought if you just do the SVD, then, you know, that is already your MPS. But it seems like it's pretty... Invalid syntax, is it? Mm. Why is it invalid syntax? Mm. Mm -mm. Just do it like that. What am I missing here though? Okay. 
Okay, that's funny. Whatever. Um, cool. It's it seems it's more like handmade, but like it's like you know I just you know, return MPS, which is basically, an, uh, it's literally a list of nodes and connected edges is a list of edges that are connected. Um, we'll calculate the memory size of MPS of different dimensions and ranks. Notice we're able to go much farther than before. D248, and here we have like, yeah, 2345. So what is these doing? So this is doing current dimensions, ranks. Okay, but that's creating something randomly. It's not it's not, it's not creating an MPS state like from a matrix, right? Because they said that's the any tensor can be written as an MPS by means of the single value decomposition. Okay. dimensions why I don't know why I don't know why this is a problem so we have that and then retrieving components of an NPS so let us now retrieve a component of a system so let us now retrieve a component of a system of physical dimension 2 and rank n20 this is equivalent to accessing the components of the wave function of a 1d quantum chain of 20 qubits the main computational cost will be the contraction of the MPS bonds, where we use a simple algorithm to perform the calculation, contract each bond successively until the entire MPS has collapsed to the desired component of the tensor. Okay. A component of a system of physical dimension two of Okay, with this scheme one can calculate a component of a tensor in a time linear in N. Not sure I understand what this is doing though. Coefficients of the tensor at the selected components. Components are. I have no idea. Dimension two. So what? Select randomly the components that we will retrieve. MPS nodes, MPS edges, create MPS. So what you're doing is for K in range. So you go through all the edges and what you're doing is you're contracting, you're contracting each of these. So you're contracting each edge. So you're multiplying coefficient of the tensor at the selected components. So what I if but what is this component what are these components being used like for? This is not used anywhere. I don't understand. Components. This is not used anywhere. Huh? <laughs> oh, it's here. Okay. A tensor components. I don't really understand this. I don't really understand what it's doing. <laughs> 
return the components of an MPS. What is a component then of a system of physical dimension two? So here you have dimension. I don't know. Components. I guess these are elements of the tensor, but like, so you're calculating a tensor by, so you're basically, with this loop, what you're doing is you're contracting all the edges, so you're kind of, you know, multiplying the matrices, and then, uh, I don't know, I really don't know. Using the using the tensor network, like tensor offers a simple built-in NPS class which can be used for tensor network calculations, which we will use in the following. Trivium component is again simply done by contracting over ancillary indices of the NPS. We'll write the entire algorithm for n equals 24 and to make reference to spins again. Uh, canonically normalize when we define the class finite NPS. Connected bonds. Hmm. I don't know. <clears throat> MPS form a special class of one dimensional quantum wave functions which are only weakly entangled. In one spatial dimension, there is a rigorous proof that ground states of gap local Hamiltonians can be approximated to arbitrary accuracy by an MPS with finite bond dimensions. Conversely, for an MPS, one can construct a local gap Hamiltonian which has this MPS as its ground state, called a parent Hamiltonian. Evaluate at the desired component. What does this mean? That's what I'm missing. So, to understand this properly, uh, eta products appear all when calculating expectation. Oh, look at this. So expectation values. So, eta products appear all when calculating expectation values and norms of quantum states. They are sometimes called overlaps. Notice that the MPS structure makes the inner product of tensors graphically intuitive, involving the contraction of all the connected edges at uh, and bonds. Um, <clears throat> an efficient algorithm takes advantage of the factorization properties of the resulting matrices. Once the tensors have been put into an MPS form, we make the contractions in a single, in a in an edge bond bond, edge bond bond sequence sweeping along the graph. Notice how the overlap vanishes as the rank of the tensors grow. If we take the inner product of an NPS with itself, we obtain the square of the norm, which is one for the normalized state. That's that's the whole thing here. Okay, I'm still not entirely sure what it. Like I'm I'm having a hard time grasping some of the concepts in terms of kind of the practicality and the connection to 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 the problem at hand. Okay, so you have big, you have a big, um, high dimensional tensor, and you, but the, the the tensor has like I mean you can just have two dimensions, right? Like doesn't matter. That's we have a Hamiltonian that has two dimensions. Um, Because the problem here is, I'm I'm struggling with the high dimensionality here, right? Because Hamiltonians, as far as I understand, they just have two dimensions; they're just matrices. Right? 
Hamiltonian of a, I don't know, three qubits. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, actually. Because maybe Hamiltonian tensors, maybe I should look for something like that. Is Hamiltonian a scalar or a tensor in quantum mechanics? A scalar operates in variant notation. The Hamiltonian satisfies this definition, but it's in Hamilton can be written as a matrix, which means it's a rank to a tensor. Does that mean the scalar operation also may be a tensor? So we have at least three vector spaces in play Hilbert space, space time, and given observer subspace isomorphic, blah, blah. Makes a 1 1 tensor. And the rotation of the coordinates you use 3D space operators can change. Uh, <sighs> So, is so is this really? It's a matrix, right? It's a two n by two n. I just think this is symmetric, which is this key symmetric, blah blah. It's really a matrix. But why is it a matrix? Why matrix? Hmm. Oh man, I'm getting too much distracted. <laughs> Uh, I thought that would be easy uh, or easier. Because essentially, like for for a um, two matrix, two dimensional matrix, you wouldn't have all these free edges here, uh, all these bonds. I don't know if they're called bonds or whatever. Um, you would just have like the edges, I guess, and then you would have elements in between. Because that, that that somewhat makes not just make much sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you have you have a Hamiltonian that has two dimensions, and so how like it, it actually wouldn't fulfill the the definition of an MPS. You cannot just turn it into an MPS because you don't have these free edges in between. Because that's the definition, right? So it says here, it says... Um, a special class of tensors that can be written as products over many rank 3 tensors. And so the ranks in between, of, in that case, wouldn't be rank 3 tensors, it would be rank 2 tensors. And so that would, that would just make no sense. So I'm just doing this wrong. Like... It's not like I cannot just take the cube and do that. Like, I, I, that's what I'm, that's what I'm really confused about right now. Because you have, and and quantum computing applications, blah blah blah. So, n is the system size, the number of qubits. So if you have uh, three qubits, you have like uh, 
three-dimensional uh, a rank three tensor if you have four qubits like a rank four tensor would you N is the rank of tensor in condensed matter or quantum computing applications and is usually the system size or number of qubits. The standard graphic representation is these. Um, for because for so that would be like for a three qubit state you kind of represent that with a cube and so kind of you have that's the, that's your tensor and so you have all the different states in that tensor no i'm so lost i'm so lost i'm gonna pause this for a second sorry I need some more coffee yeah i don't know <laughs> kind of stupid because like what are we trying to do? Okay, so we have the cube, and you want to find the ground state of the cubo, but the cubo is just a two-dimensional matrix. Um, so why do you need that? Like you cannot like a uh, rank two rank two tensor MPS. Like you cannot like. Hamiltonian MPS example. That's that's confusing me a lot. So that's confusing me a lot right now. Tensor network states for the description of quantum antibody systems. Oh, that's in German. <laughs> no way. Oh, wait a second. There's this German summary. Okay. Background construction. Local gap Hamilton is in, in one dimension. It's supposed to fill the area law. Construction. We consider a chain of n spin s particles. In order to construct an MPS for the system, we attach two virtual particles of spin s to each side, one on the left, one on the right. Furthermore, we assume that they are in the product state of maximum entangled pairs connecting neighbor sides. Construction of an MPS with open boundary conditions, uh, maximally entangled virtual pairs are placed between neighboring sides, blue balls. So literally, each of those elements is actually a qubit. Which would mean that what we're trying to do is um, I'm getting really confused. <laughs> I'll leave it here. <laughs> I'm getting really confused <laughs> right now. Because it's you've got you've got the dimensions, but the Hamilton is two-dimensional. Why is the Hamilton two-dimensional? If we have a 
Okay, it's not two dim it's two dimensional because it has columns and rows. But you could also reshape it, right? Because at the end of the day, what you have is you have like, you know, if you say three qubits, you have like an eight by eight uh, matrix because you have like two to the power of three states inside the system. So you can flatten this to a, to a matrix, but like in reality, you've got a tensor of rank three. Whereas if you've got two qubits, you've got a tensor rank two, which is a matrix, and, and that can just be separated into um, into two products, right? So, so maybe consider the Hermitian matrix H acting in vector space that is a tensor product of n smaller spaces, each of dimension d. Yeah, but then the first thing you need to do is terms. of a large matrix. The matrix is usually assumed to be a rich matrix, but it can also be... But here they say it's a matrix, right? But you gotta... You, you definitely have to... You definitely have to reshape that for this to work. Consider Hermitian matrix H acting in the vector space that is the tensor product of n smaller spaces, but then it's not a matrix. How can it be a matrix? This is not a matrix. It's a then tensor. It's bothering me a lot, <laughs> but I think it's a good exercise. It's really a good exercise to go through to understand that. But yeah, <sighs> it's a long journey. <laughs>